Okay, so I will formally uh, open <coughs> this uh, afternoon session and uh, uh, welcome uh, the participants uh, remotely participating and uh, uh, welcoming uh, Nistor Valls, <laughs> who is the only MEP. Oh, no, we are two now. Uh, thank you. Three, sorry, three. Uh, it's, it's four, oh, my God. Um, so, we start this um, debate on the always sensitive issue of the use of woody biomass for energy production in the EU. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to uh, welcome uh, the uh, writer of uh, the GRC report, Sarah Mubareka. You will have the floor first for uh, 10 minutes to uh, make the uh, uh, presentation of the report, then the commission, and then uh, the coordinators on the representative, and then the CADGIAF. So, uh, as we all know, we are ahead of uh, important files where the uh, woody biomass will play a significant role, whether we talk about uh, uh, the LUCF or other topics in the June package. We are also in the heart of the discussion regarding the taxonomy regulation and the use of biomass. So it's a very uh, timely report. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Madame Mubareka, for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I would also like to thank the, the ENVI Committee for inviting the Joint Research Center of the European Commission uh, to present the findings of our study on the use of woody biomass for energy production in the EU. There are, of course, many colleagues uh, involved in the study. You signaled me as the writer, but there are um, actually several um, uh, experts who are involved in the writing of this study. And I have the privilege here to thank you on their behalf today. So we know very well that there is a lot of discussion around the sustainability of bioenergy, and we conducted this study to support policymakers uh, in their decision on this complex file. Last, uh, could I ask you to switch the slide, please? Ah, you hadn't, okay, now you may go to the next slide, thank you. Thank you. Last May, the biodiversity strategy for 2030 uh, announced that the Commission would publish JRC's assessment on the use of forest biomass production for energy. It stated specifically in the strategy that this study should inform the announced review of the current EU climate and energy legislation in light of the biodiversity ambition uh, in the European Green Deal. In this context, our research had a very specific purpose. As the European Commission scientific arm, we were asked to produce a study that would be relevant to the current EU political context. We had a mandate to inform the reviews uh, of important legislation, so we were not being asked in this case to assess one specific bioenergy pathway or another. We were being asked to do actually the opposite, to expand the scope of choice beyond what had already been evaluated in the current, uh, what, what is now the current and climate and energy legislative package. So this time we had to go beyond climate and energy and we had to consider the impacts on forest biodiversity. We approached the problem through uh, a quantitative assessment of the supply of woody biomass today and through a qualitative assessment uh, on of the theoretical or potential impacts of both climate and and biodiversity uh, of different pathways that could be used to mobilize additional biomass for bioenergy. Next slide, please. In our quantitative assessment, we looked at the sources and the uses of woody biomass for bioenergy. Our main uh, findings are actually summarized here in this slide. You see a wood flow diagram, which is, a, we call, it's called the Sankey diagram. Um, to make this wood flow diagram, we used several sources of data that countries are reporting. So they're reporting to FAO, uh, UNECE, Eurostat, and of course the National Renewable Energy Action Plan progress reports. The data is very patchy. Uh, not all years are represented. Not all countries are always represented. Um, the, the data is available in different units, for example, and so there was a lot of work behind bringing this all together to show a single picture of the flow of woody biomass uh, through the system. 
At the top of the flow diagram, you see that most wood in the EU is reported as being sourced domestically, so they're coming from our forests. Of course, there is um, a component of import. And then there's a component of unreported removals. We know this because we make a balance sheet of the sources and the uses of woody biomass uh, for each country and summed up for the EU. If you look to the middle of the Sankey diagram, uh, you see an orange uh, arrow, a loop. This shows the circularity within the forest-based sector. The reuse of byproducts from the forest-based industries is, is really a fantastic uh, example of circularity. The byproducts generated by the industries are very valuable. In fact, we move uh, to the bottom of the Sankey and you see that many also go to bioenergy. Uh, so, by the way, in general, prioritizing residues and cascade use of, of wood remains a, a key overarching principle for maximizing the positive uh, benefits uh, of, of bioenergy, we have to remember. In the bottom part of the Sankey, we see that there are three main categories of woody biomass going towards bioenergy. So we see the primary, the green arrow, the secondary is the blue arrow, but we also have some uncategorized uh, wood. If we move to the, the pie chart, you can see this quantified. So 49% of the woody um, biomass um, going to bioenergy is, are from secondary sources. 37%, we're sure, are from primary sources. Um, about half are stems and half are tops and branches. And of the stems, uh, we have also a contribution from uh, coppice, uh, forest managed as coppice. The remaining 14%, this gray wedge, uh, is we know it's used for bioenergy, but it's not categorized in the reporting. And this is an important point I would like to make. We need, we certainly need better data on how much and what type of woody biomass is being used for bioenergy in order to better monitor its sustainability. Uh, the JRC is is investing in this um, uh, with our counterparts in the member states. And now I'm going to move to the sustainability assessment portion of the study. If I could ask for the next slide, please. Thank you very much. So we hypothesize that if the demand for bioenergy uh, were to rise, the supply for wood for energy would have to rise as well, either by changing the way forests are managed or by increasing forest area or by changing consumption patterns. Among all these possible ways in which biomass could be increased, we chose to focus on three specific interventions, and of course there are many more. The three that we focused on were changes in forest management through an increased collection of logging residues, afforestation, and conversion of forest to plantations. We assess the different pathways within each of these interventions according to their, uh, both their potential risk for climate and uh, biodiversity protection. We found that among the pathways we assessed, there are win-win pathways. These are shown in the green quadrant, you see. Uh, for example, the removal of fine woody debris, which includes the branches and tops of trees, could be beneficial to climate without damaging forest ecosystems if removed from forests within sustainable thresholds that have to be, of course, locally set. Um, afforestation on form former agricultural land would, uh, with mixed species plantations would enhance the terrestrial sink and thus would contribute to climate change mitigation while at the same time improving ecosystems conditions. We also found a number of interventions that are win-lose, uh, meaning that they could eventually contribute to the climate mitigation efforts, um, but they may be harmful to, to ecosystems, for example, afforestation on heathlands and natural gra grasslands. And finally, uh, among lose-lose pathways, um, meaning that they result in both negative for biodiversity and uh, climate potential risks. For example, the conversion of natural and old growth forests to plantations is extremely negative for both. And there are many more findings and I, I warmly invite you to, to look at the report if, um, if you haven't already. Next slide, please. So our report uh, includes the following key policy relevant messages. In the first uh, place, we, we've shown that better data is required. Um, we don't have the full picture. 
if we want to properly monitor what's happening with forest-based bioenergy, we need more timely and less heterogeneous and uh, just better data. So the governance regulation includes new reporting requirements on biomass supply and use that will help address those gaps and the implementation of the Red 2 sustainability criteria, including tracking of forest biomass use in large installations will help, but a possible extension uh, could be to um, focus also on installations that um, are below 20 megawatt that might help improve monitoring. Uh, second, the potential biodiversity risks identified in our study can be uh, effectively minimized through the robust implementation of the new Red 2 sustainability criteria on forest biomass at member state level. It's essential that countries define precautionary landscape retention thresholds in sourcing areas, producing bioenergy uh, feedstock for all three categories of residues, slash the low stumps and the coarse woody debris. In the report, we also warn about divergent incentives between the LULUCF regulation where countries are discouraged from harvesting forests and the Red 2 where operators are incentivized to use woody biomass for bioenergy. The third point is the no-go areas that are currently applicable only to agricultural biomass under the Red 2 could be applied also to forest biomass and this would provide additional safeguards uh, against sourcing of biomass in highly biodiverse ecosystems. Fourth, we caution that, a minima, uh, that to minimize the risks of unintended impacts on biodiversity, uh, foreseen afforestation actions uh, of the biodiversity strategy should be addressed using appropriate safeguards and guidelines to promote ecologically sound interventions. And finally, we mentioned that Europe could act on its global footprint by developing measures to address the potential risks associated to imported biomass or for material or, or energy use alike produced from plantations established through harmful afforestation or conversion activities. Thank you very much. You may uh, move to the next slide to show the link to the report and to our websites. Thank you very much. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we move now to the uh, uh, discussion and uh, we start with the, the Commission, uh, DGNR, with uh, Katarina Sikomani. Uh, the floor is yours for five minutes. Many thanks, uh, President Canfin, and good afternoon, uh, honorary members. First of all, uh, many thanks for organizing this uh, discussion today on a very timely manner uh, from my side. And many thanks to Sarah and her colleagues at the Joint Research Center for this uh, very valuable report. So biomass is currently the main renewable source uh, we have in energy. It represents 60% uh, of all renewables in the EU, and it is key for achieving the 2030 and 2050 targets. Bioenergy uh, represents for many member states uh, an indispensable way of uh, making the energy transition happen away from fossil fuels. So, and we expect uh, bioenergy to continue to play an important role also uh, in the carbon neutrality uh, framework until 2050 uh, and beyond. Bioenergy is seen important to decarbonize, in particular, the so-called hard-to-abate sectors uh, in the context of an integrated energy system. And these sectors could be, for instance, heavy-duty transport or aviation, where electrification is uh, complex or not cost-efficient. Uh, but at the same time, of course, the sustainability of bioenergy is an important requirement for its future development. And this is in particular in the context of increasing harvesting in European forests. Carbon sinks are going down, as we have seen, and approximately 30% of our forests are in bad conversation status. So we need to uh, look into the sustainability very carefully, and the Commission is listening, listening to the public debate uh, on any potential environmental and climate risks that are related to bioenergy production. Um, as was uh, referred to in, in uh, Sarah, Sarah's presentation, the EU sustainable 
sustainability framework sorry, has been significantly strengthened will, with the uh, recently adopted Renewable Energy Directive, which uh, will be implemented by member states uh, or transposed by member states into national law by June this year. The new Renewables Energy Directive includes enhanced sustainability criteria uh, covering not only biofuels, but also large-scale use of biomass and biogas in heat and power. The directive also promotes the shift to advanced biofuels based on residues and non-reusable -re and non-recyclable waste. The report from JRC confirms that prioritizing residues and the cascade use of wood remains a key overarching principle for maximizing the positive climate impact of bioenergy and limit the risk uh, in the bioenergy uh, land use interface. This is consistent with the biodiversity strategy commitment uh, of focusing on non-recyclable waste and residues while minimizing the use of whole trees for energy production. Um, the Sustainability criteria in the directive should not be seen in isolation. This should be complementary and we should look at the uh, regulation on land use, land use change and forestry, the so-called LULU, LULU CCF, and the emission trading scheme uh, and also the common agricultural policy. As highlighted by the JRC report, it is important to ensure consistency between all the different uh, legislations and instruments. Uh, I would then want to raise uh, two points. Uh, so as highlighted by the report, the current sustainability criteria in the uh, Renewables Directive for forest biomass can effectively avoid many of the potential environmental risks uh, that are associated to increased biomass production. But the precondition for this is that these criteria are properly implemented by member states. And as I mentioned, the transposition deadline is in June this year. And in this respect, we from the Commission side, we are currently finalizing an implementing act uh, that will provide guidance to member states in order to promote a robust and harmonized implementation uh, of the, uh, and verification of these criteria. The draft act was published uh, end of March and it is now in the four-week-long public consultation. And of course, the Parliament uh, will be duly consulted under the procedures in place. Then, secondly, the JRC report uh, recommends or makes two key policy recommendations for uh, the future for further increasing the environmental safeguards for bioenergy. And the first of these uh, policy recommendations is uh, to apply additional no-go areas to forest biomass um, in order to minimize the risk of ha biomass harvesting in primary and old growth forests. And the second recommendation of the report for the uh, short-term future is to extend the scope of the sustainability criteria to cover also heat and power installations below 20 megawatts, so for smaller installations in order to increase the environmental effectiveness. In this context, the review that we are currently working on, on the Renewables Directive, um, we, will, we will assess a number of options for such uh, targeted strengthening of the sustainability criteria. Our aim indeed is to find the right balance between promoting sustainable production of biomass for material and energy uses uh, whilst at the same time preserving and restoring biodiversity and enhancing carbon sinks. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. So we move to <coughs> the coordinators or their representatives, starting with the EPP and Peter Lisa. Monsieur Peter Lisa n'est pas connecté. Peter Lise is not uh, connected yet, so uh, there is no representative for the EPP. Huh? 
we will move, we will uh, move uh, back to the EPP a bit later on. So we move to SND and Utah Gutterland. Madam Gutterland, please press the speak button. Ms. Gutterland, please press the speak button. Okay. Can you see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would first like to thank you from the Joint Research uh, Center for preparing this important and valuable contribution with the report. I truly believe that we need to have an informed debate about these issues that are sometimes also sensitive. We need to take good care of our forests. They are, as many times pointed out, our green lungs. I'm from a country with large and thriving forests myself, and I know how important they are to ensure biodiversity, but also, of course, for climate and for the supply of the products that can substitute fossil uh, alternatives. It is interesting to see that almost half of the wood-based bioenergy production in Europe is based on secondary biomass. It is important that we get a better grasp of the composition of the unclassified 14%. I truly believe that the objectives on forest protection, strengthening biodiversity, wood production and other ecosystem service are not in contradiction with each other, but it takes political action to ensure that we are uh, use our forest in the best way, that we're uh, the most valuable forest from an ecosystem perspective are protected, and that wider use of carbon capture and storage can account for the carbon emission associated with any wood-based energy production. I look forward to see proper implementation of the Red 2 Directive in line with the EU sustainability criteria, such as legally regeneration, protection of sensitive areas, minimization of biodiversity impacts, and maintenance of long-term forest productivity. Lastly, I also welcome that the carbon impacts are better accounted for under the Lulu CF sector, need to be as transparent as possible with citizens on how to reach our climate targets by reducing emissions and protecting our forests, not by changing methods of accounting. It is important that this accounting is including all emissions produced during production, harvesting, transportation and processing, but also the soil caption emission and the carbon payback time of the specific feedstock. We hope from the SD that these perspectives are well reflected in the upcoming Fit for 55 or 60 package. Thank you. Thank you for this reference to the ongoing negotiation of the climate law. Uh, so we move to Renew and uh, Nis Torvalds. Thank you, Pascal, and uh, uh, thank you to, 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 to the, for the, the people who made the report. I think it's um, highly interesting, even if I have some, also some negative remarks, and the negative remarks actually goes to the, the, the problem we always have with something coming out from the Commission or reported or, uh, or by, done by the Commission or, or, or ordered by them, and that's a silo approach, uh, because you see a very clear silo approach also in this report. Uh, and if we would like to have some good uh, decisions in the future, politically good decisions in, in the future, we would also know, need uh, socio-economic uh, applications of, uh, in this case. But going back to the very good parts of this report, uh, you have, the, for instance, the salvage loggings. I think the information on page 37, 38, 39, about salvage logging is actually informa good information because it shows what uh, uh, forest management actually can do in, in cases like this. If you look at, at some other countries, the salvage logging for are very high and in countries with a long history of, of uh, doing the right things in the right way, you have very low salvage log loggings, which is in a way 
uh, total logical. Then, if we look back uh, at uh, the issue of Lulu CF, you mentioned it already, then we see that the Lulu CF isn't actually, hasn't actually been using information of, of a very high quality. I just got yesterday or the day before yesterday a German publication, Netto Beitrag der Kellen und Senken aus Lulu CF in den Deutschen Triebhaus Gauss Inventar 2001 bis 2021. And if you look at the, the, the picture, it goes up and down like a, like a merry go, more like a merry-go-round than, than a scientific system. And we surely need some better information to be able to cope with this. Then my fourth comment, and then I will stop. I come back to, uh, with more questions to you personally, because I think we have a lot of good information here. One of the problems we are always running into is what uh, I would call keel hauling, you know, in the old good days when a scientist at some institution made something very stupid, he was uh, hauled under the keel. And uh, I'm not going to suggest that to you this time. But the keel hauling in this case is that we are, all the member states are put more or less in the same sort of category, even if uh, the trees you have in the different member states are different, the, they grow in different ways, the biodiversity is actually very different. So when you have just figures which are showing uh, the main picture, then you don't see the real picture there out in the nature. And that is a shortcoming which is uh, going to bother us also in the future. But I would uh, still like to thank you for uh, the very good report and I will be doing my homework for the future because uh, when the LULU-CF is coming up, I hope I will be able to contribute to a good decision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we move to ID, Madame Griset. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci pour votre présentation. Thank you. La preuve qu'elle commence à se soucier concrètement des conséquences environnementales de ces orientations et décisions. Vous dites vous-même que ces orientations peuvent se percuter. La directive RED2 stimule la demande de bioénergie chez les opérateurs économiques, tandis que le règlement LULUCF dissuade les pays de réclamer. C'est très difficile de suivre la très, très rapide pour les interprétateurs. La marge de manœuvre est limitée. Your report speaks on the difficulties of obtaining data to calculate incidents of, uh, on, on the climate. We don't even know whether combusting wood is biomass would reduce the um, need for fossil fuels. European governance doesn't have enough data but it's also infringing on competences of individual states. Even bioenergy um, mixture is optimal. Even if it's durable biomass, it still affects what's already planted. Don't you think that bearing in mind the, the, the deadlines, we should look for a low carbon source, nuclear power? Either you develop bioenergy at the expense of forests and you have to, uh, or you develop nuclear energy which doesn't pose any of the problems that I've just enumerated. Interpreters will apologize for fast reading. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I re really would like to thank the JRC for their uh, for their report. Uh, it's a very it is confirming, of course, also some of the problems that we already identified when we were discussing Red Two uh, a couple of years ago. But but let's let's say that we can hopefully remedy some of the problems uh, when we are doing Red Three. So most of my questions will be to the Commission because I have to say. Uh, the contribution of the Commission was uh, rather general, 
and and not really specific to the report that is in front of us. And I think it becomes very crucial that the Commission becomes a bit more concrete on uh, what they're going to do. Uh, first of all, in the report, it's very clear that 14% uh, is uncategorized, which means it could be illegal logging or whatsoever. So the question to the Commission is, what is the Commission going to propose in order to improve the monitoring so that this level of uncategorized biomass used for energy will be getting smaller? Because that is a huge loophole, of course, which is now staying under the radar and where no criteria, sustainability criteria, are being linked to. So that's very problematic. And 14% is not nothing. So I would like to hear the Commission being concrete here. Then secondly, if you read the report, and we saw the graph, so thanks a lot for that, um, of the 24 scenarios, only five scenarios uh, will deliver win-win situations. And I think JSC was quite clear to say we should promote, we should make sure that our policies are making sure that it's only the win-win scenario, so five of 24 possible routes that only the win-win ones will be allowed to be called sustainable. So this is another question to the Commission. Um, what is the Commission going to propose for the sustainability criteria on the Red 3 in order to make sure that the win-win scenarios are being used and for sure that the lose-lose ones, which were quite a lot, are certainly not possible? And this means, are you going to exclude whole trees? Are you only going to allow burning fine woody debris? Are you going to make sure that enough of the biomass is left on the soil? I mean, these are concrete questions coming from these scenarios where in order to make sure that you end up with only the win-win ones to being stimulated. And the last question, and this is really urgent, this is also linking to the taxonomy proposal that you will come, that you will produce next week. And also there again, in the current proposals that we have seen, still whole tree burning is even being considered as being labeled green. So what is the Commission going to do also with this knowledge to make sure that next week in its taxonomy proposal, we are not labeling these kind of things that are not up in the win-win corner, that we are even calling them green. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for ECR, Alexander Vondra. Yeah, thank you, Pascal. I think uh, one general remarks with whoever I, I'm talking from the scientific community, uh, from the environmental sciences, from nature conversation, uh, conservation, uh, they are all warning that we should not repeat the same mistake like with the biofuel. So, uh, yes, of course, we are aware of the danger uh, for cutting the uh, the old grown forest, but even, you know, with various expanding of the monoculture plantations, uh, this time not in the Indonesia and Brazil, but, for example, in Africa, can cause a lot of damages. So that's, uh, I think we should be aware of that and not repeat the mistake. And then, uh, on, on concretely, I think there is a problem with the data, data in, in consistencies. The study shows significant inconsistencies. The amount of woody mass, the biomass used in manufacturing uh, of wood-based products and for energy production exceed the total amount reported as source by more than 20 percent. So the study suggests that the energy sector is primarily responsible for this gap. But it might be even worse since there is this a tendency of reporting the origin of the wood as unknown in, in the energy sector. So this should not be acceptable, especially when energy from woody miles biomass is sold as sustainable energy. And there is also the ethical dimension. It is quite unusual for researchers to state that more research won't be able to solve a problem However, in this case, I totally agree with the researchers that more research can solve the ethical uh, dilemmas related to the use of uh, biomass for energy uh, production. And it's also important to realize that policymaking is different from running a PR campaign. When Parliament increases uh, the climate targets, it has to be aware of the fact that these targets have to be met. And it is easy to call for the rapid phase-out of fossil fuels, but economically and practically, 
alternatives must be available. And there is no infinitive source of sustainable woody biomass. And it's therefore of the utmost important not uh, to rule out uh, our current options too soon and to keep uh, the realistic targets in mind. Thanks. Thank you. And for the left, Miquelas. Thanks very much, Pascal. Uh, in the main graphic in the report, the one reproduced in the executive summary, short term is defined as 20 years. However, Table 5 on page 102 of the report states that absolutely no wood taken from existing forests will provide carbon benefits compared to fossil fuels over 10 years, and defines that 10-year period as short term. Therefore, there are two very different definitions of short term in the report. The main graphic is arguably the centerpiece of the report, yet the definition of short term in that graphic is twice as long as the definition of the short term on page 102. Can you explain this? It is significant because if the centerpiece graphic of the report were to use 10 years rather than 20 years, it would show clearly that there are no scenarios involving wood from existing forests that show carbon benefits compared to fossil fuels in the short term. And Secondly, the so-called sustainability and greenhouse gas criteria in red 2 do nothing to ensure biomass use reduces emissions and little or nothing to restrict the ecosystem impact on biomass use. The criteria permits forests to be clear-cut and entirely burnt for fuel. In Ireland, for example, more than 40% of harvested Sitka spruce is burnt for energy. I find the report's conclusions, for example, on page 10, that the implementation of the sustainability criteria by member states is a solution to the negative impacts of biomass use to be strange, even if the tree pathway study do not include the cutting of whole trees for fuel, which is in itself a strange omission. This conclusion, I find, is in fact at odds with a lot of the findings of the report, and maybe you'll comment on this. And lastly, uh, to back up uh, Bass's point, uh, around the fact that the report points to a significant increase overall in EU use of woody biomass, about 20% since 2000, and an increasing tendency not to disclose its source. Seemingly 14% is reported uncategorised. And in other words, really, almost half of the wood used in energy production comes from the forest, not the leftovers from sawmills and pump mills. Would you be concerned about this? So I will formally open uh, the Catch the Eye. I have already a number of names on my list. Please raise your hands in the room or electronically. So we start with the EPP and uh, Michel Vizic. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I suppose a major of us here have struggled to explain uh, the sense behind the text of a particular piece of legislation for the constituents. And for me, this is the case with the red directive. How to explain to our citizens that renewable energy is also a forest being burned down to generate uh, energy, including 200 year old trees growing in unprotected old growth forest, which are chipped and grinded and going straight to an energy plant. It might sound like an extreme scenario, you might argue, however, there is really nothing in the red which could assure us that subsidies do not go to energy generated in this extreme way. There are operators who operate also on roundwood, and they are happy with the text of the 2018 directive. We all know it. In 2009, probably nobody imagined this would be the reality, and the directive adopted in 2018 has no potential to improve the situation. There is a lot of to be optimized. Burning down forest in the sake of replacing fossil fuels is a lose-lose option. Will the Commission correct this and will it amend the directive so that we do not any more incentivize burning whole trees, destroying forest ecosystems? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, for SND de la Bocart. Hi, so thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, actually, most of the points I wanted to raise were already mentioned, but I want to maybe sharpen the question on them. So 
The first part was the question on, on the Implementing Act on Guidance of the Forest Biomass Criteria under Red 2, um, where a lot of colleagues mentioned how crucial it is to instruct member states and economic emperors how to demonstrate compliance with the new sustainability criteria. So um, I would like to ask you what are the takeaways from your research that should be considered in the Draft Implementing Act? And the second question would go to um, to the mention of your report, which says that in the context of the new EU climate target, there is an opportunity to see the LULUCF sector like any other sector without filtering of the reported LULUCF greenhouse gas emissions through a complex set of accounting rules. So which consequences should that have in your opinion? Should the criteria for the forest reference levels be changed? And if so, how? Or should forest land accounting move away from forest reference level accounting towards a net-net accounting approach where the forest emissions are compared to a historic base period like it is done also with emissions from cropland and grassland under LULUCF? So this would be the questions. Thank you very much again. Thank you. We move to Renew and Emma Wiesner. Thanks uh, uh, very much. I'm really happy for this report because there's right now a picture spread that we are burning down our forests for energy. And that is simply not the case. I'm from Sweden, a country covered with 60% uh, being forests in Sweden. Uh, the bioeconomy of Sweden and Finland covering 30% of the bioeconomy of Europe as, as such. Um, and I, that's also why this, this question is so triggering for me. So one, the first question I have to the GRC is how do you define the old growth forest? In Sweden, we have had forestry for over 500 years, uh, and we see that there's no clear definition of what an old growth forest is. So I wonder how do you measure that, taking that into account in the report? Uh, secondly, uh, I'm really happy to see that almost 50% of the bioenergy used is secondary biomass. Uh, but, and, and I am worried about the 37% primary biomass. But I wonder, because in the definition of primary, you include branches and tops, and also, I guess, thinning, round wood from thinning, when you're, you're actually helping the forest to grow. You need to remove some of the smaller trees in order to make the forest thrive, in order to make this timber that we so much need, uh, replacing steel and, and concrete, for example. So I, I wonder, do you know of the 37% uh, of primary, do you know how much of that that is actually high quality stem wood? Because I see that the debate is now, people think that it is high quality stem wood that we're burning, but I don't see that, that the 37% here is actually high quality. Thank you, sorry, I, I yeah. have to sorry. stick to the uh, allocated time. Uh, we move to the Greens and Martin Osley. Well, it's very good when we have this data. I think in some things we don't have enough data, actually, but something that we have to take into consideration is the, is the uh, development of um, 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 the, uh, so to say, dried out forest. And now that has increased dramatically, dramatically in Germany. Um, and what happens is, of course, is over for de uh, deforestation and uh, export to China. But this particular issue hasn't been taken up in this particular report. So we have a situation that over the years to come, we're going to have even less wood available. And it really won't work out the way it's uh, laid down here. It won't work because it is against the biodiversity directive. In the biodiversity uh, directive, we have old forests, the need for old forests, the need to keep wood in the forests. And uh, it's uh, when we speak about that 20% uh, figure in um, deforestation, uh, well, I think that that particular figure is totally out of range because it really would create that sustainable forest that we ever so much need. And and uh, also the particular issue that has come up on other occasions with bush wood from Namibia and the importation of that, that's totally unacceptable. Thank you.
Well, so I'd, I'd like to clarify the situation with regard to bioenergy. When we look at renewables, there is also there are other types of renewables as well. Biomass is what is focused on here. Well, it makes up 70% of renewable energy in the European Union. The question is if uh, it is sustainable and it leads to a reduction in emissions. There are numerous different factors and interests as well which have to be taken into consideration. Now, uh, this uh, report is very opportune in nature, I ought to say. Um, the ETS is taken into consideration as are numerous other different elements as well. Now, there is also the issue of inconsistency of data. Now, there is a certain amount of inconsistency, I feel, and if we want to take a look at the numerous different factors, well, cutting down forests in order to create bioenergy for numerous different regions. Now, I'm questioning all of this. Biomass, perhaps, not considering it a renewable, that might be one approach as well. Is it indeed renewable in nature? And what sort of impact do you think the needs for importing of biomass to the European Union from outside of the European Union, what impact will that have? And how will we have standards, European standards, imposed on import? Ms. Paulus, please press the speak button. Yes, thank you very much for this very important report and thanks for being with us today. I would like to emphasize a bit that um, I would like to know from the Commission, how will you assess the, uh, what has been written on the carbon payback time in this report? I me seem to recall a number of 86 years. So, um, are we really doing the right thing in regarding biomass as carbon neutral? And my second question goes to the JRC, honorable members. Um, I admit I did not read every single page from top to bottom, but um, what I was missing is the view of the um, so effect of the soil. And we are talking about LULUCF, right, and about um, how we can how we can assess the, the land cover and all this, but if you have a forest which is grown on drained peat soil, then you have a constant emission of CO2 from the peat soil that is being oxidized by, um, by the air which comes to the soil now that it's drained. So if there is no change, then these emissions from the soil go on and on and on, so you don't have any change in the Lulu CF, but at the same time you have a devastating climate impact. Now I would like to know whether um, this effect of forest being grown on drain peat land is taken into account in the report. I couldn't find anything Thank you. on it. Thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, we move now to the GRC first and the, then the Commission. Uh, Sarah Mubarika for five minutes. Ms. Mubarika, please press the speak button. I apologize for that. Hello. So thank you very much for very stimulating and very important questions. I hope I've captured everything. I've categorized the questions in a sense, um, and I'll do my best to answer them in five minutes. So I think the first point to clarify is on the statistics. Um, yes, 14% of uh, woody biomass used for uh, bioenergy is, is uncategorized. Um, but I think uh, what the honorable member uh, from the Greens was or was referring to was more on the sources side. So um, the removals from the forest that are not declared, I think is, is probably the point uh, that, that should be uh, more on focus. And that's, that's about 12, 13%. So that means that 13% of the wood is just unaccounted for, but that's related to the whole forest-based bioeconomy. So all forest industries and it's not um, a plague, let's say, only related to bioenergy. Uh, we're not sure if it's related only to bioenergy. Let's put it that way, because uh, we're looking on the sources side. 
Um, so related to illegal logging, we don't know either because we mm, we use statistics. So what are declared uh, as the sources and uses of woody biomass are our source for data. And I hardly think anyone will declare that they're illegally logging anything. For that, we would have to rely on uh, you know, different means, like satellite imagery, for example, that also provides more timely data, real-time data, if we want. So I think it's important to, to um, check again the statistics on that. Uh, as to the question on primary uh, woody biomass, so um, primary is for sure coming from forests or other woodlands. Uh, it's partly stem wood and partly the tops and, and branches, so we could call that logging residues that for an industry that might be industrial roundwood use. So it's a bit uh, complicated in that sense, but it's correct to say that primary woody biomass is coming from the forest, but some about half are logging residues, okay, and then the other half are stems. This is, uh, there was a question on whether or not we knew what the quality of the stems were. No, we do not, and that's very important, so we do not have uh, data on that. We do not know that, no. Um, then we were discussing also oh, the, well, the limitations of the study I'll leave for later. They're very important. Uh, we were looking at the Implementing Act, right? And so I believe if I understood the question correctly, we were asked, what do we think about it? Well, we think it's, it's, a, it's a very much a, a step forward and, and it was difficult to assess the sustainability of uh, forest-based bioenergy without having this Implementing Act in place yet. So this is why we took the choice to assess, um, let's call them aspirational pathways for uh, provision of woody biomass. We do think, that, of course, and this is, I said in my conclusions, that uh, no-go areas can be extended. So the concept of no-go areas, which means, I mean, it's not just not using wood from um, primary force. It's also using wood or condoning the use of wood for uh, bioenergy from what was previously grasslands or any highly biodiverse natural forest or protected areas or any... Uh, biodiverse rich land. So this should cover, I believe, uh, the reference to, to the use of Sitka spruce in, in Ireland, uh, though I'm not sure about the technicalities of that. And of course, um, we also think that the, the, um, the limit of the 20 megawatt plant could be maybe a bit uh, lowered so that uh, we have more let's say, better safeguards, as uh, the director for Enner uh, mentioned, for, um, let's say, we, we avoid a loophole, let's say. We'll put it that way. Um, in terms of the limitations of the study, so, yes, I take very much to heart the comment that we did not cover the social economics part of this. This is an, uh, we responded with this study to the bioeconomy, or sorry, the biodiversity strategy, and it's an action, this study was an action of the biodiversity strategy, so we did focus on environmental sustainability, but we're very conscientious that social and economic sustainability play a part. However, uh, in the time we had to produce this study, we've, we chose to focus on environmental aspects, clearly, given the context. Um, uh, in terms of soil, yes, it is taken into consideration. I appreciate the, the question. Um, not explicitly in the study, but it, because it's part of the qualitative assessment that we did on the meta-analysis on the biodiversity impacts of these pathways. And so soil is implicitly uh, considered there also for the carbon accounting side of things. Uh, with respect to the role of scientists and, and the ethics, I, I really liked that question, in fact. Um, so <clears throat> um, we, we understand that this is a highly debated uh, issue, and um, the role of the scientists, in our view, is, is not to resolve the ethical issues, but rather to, well, provide the baseline, baseline science. I think it's very important that we don't cross the line and, and not become advocates uh, in that sense, particularly in our role as the, uh, the science house for the European Commission. Oh, I'm not sure if, uh, I ha how much time I have left, if I can go on. Well, um, please wait, take one additional minute and then... 
Thank you okay. for the commission. Yes, there was a very important point on the, the um, how we categorized or um, binned, let's call it, the, um, the, 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 the time, let's say the time frame for the carbon uh, impacts, so the carbon emissions impacts. So uh, we do, I mean, I think it's explained quite well. I mean, there are what we consider short term are um, pathways that are likely to achieve carbon savings compared to fossil sources e e within one or two decades. So that's the, the short term, that's the box, let's say. And the like Okay, it was a bit less than one minute, so. Uh, so I suggest we move to the Commission uh, as we start uh, running late uh, for the next agenda item. Uh, we move to uh, Madame Sikowani. Many thanks, uh, uh, President Kampin uh, and colleagues uh, for the many interesting comments and questions indeed. I can be very brief because most of the questions were, of course, put to the colleague in, from JRC. Um, first, I would want to comment on the uh, comment that bioenergy is considered as carbon neutral. Um, this is something we hear very often, but it is actually not the case, uh, because one has to look at the broader EU climate and energy framework uh, in order to determine uh, the uh, carbon impact of bioenergy. So even if bioenergy combust combustion em emissions are not accounted for in the energy sector, uh, these are can't accounted for in the land use and land use change and forestry sectors. So uh, the carbon impacts are accounted there and they, they are only counted once. So that is the explanation there. Then coming back to the uh, comments uh, on, on the data and the 14% of unaccounted, uh, I think my colleague from JSC responded to this, and it is something that we absolutely must uh, get more information on in order to know what is happening there. Part of it, of course, is how, how household usage of uh, forest products. Uh, um, the upcoming implementing delegating, delegating acts that I referred to already will certainly improve also on the question of data and how forest management, how the data uh, requirements and also how uh, outside EU uh, requirements are specified and how these are to be verified. So the implementing act here will improve considerably the information uh, requirements and the monitoring and verification of that information. We will also uh, pr present later in the spring uh, another implementing act, which is on the certification. So how to certificate, how to certificate what are the requirements for the uh, voluntary schemes, what are the minimum requirements that then the Commission will assess and uh, approve or not, uh, what are these requirements uh, there. So this will, again, further improve the quality of data and the quality uh, of the uh, bioenergy that will then uh, be sourced through. And then my last comment uh, on the uh, upcoming uh, legislation uh, that will be part of the Fit for 55% uh, target that is to be scheduled, which is scheduled for this uh, summer. Um, I mean, we are certainly looking at all the elements that the uh, honorary members have raised. So how to make sure that we have better data, uh, how to, what is the role for uh, whole wood, uh, what is the role uh, to be played then uh, of the uh, uh, cascading principle, etc., etc. Um, but as we heard also today from the uh, discussion, the reality is very diverse in the different parts of Europe. And we need to look at the situation in different parts in order to have the best approach to all these questions. I mean, the question of thinning wood, for instance, was already mentioned. So all these elements are currently being considered very carefully, and we will uh, address all of them in the most optimal way we, we can when the package will be tabled in June. Until then, uh, we will certainly be happy to continue the discussions with, uh, with you in the committee or on a bilateral basis. 
Many thanks. Okay, well, uh, I think that members uh, could have expected more precise answers to the, 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 their questions, but uh, uh, we will uh, get back, of course, to these uh, topics uh, later on with the uh, very important uh, regulation we are going to, to discuss and vote on uh, that were mentioned, like uh, Red 3 and LULUC 